Jeff Gurman was a true journalist, a man who did intense investigations and reporting, a journalist who held the powerful accountable. Jeff worked for the Las Vegas Review Journal. His investigations looked at everyone from law enforcement to corporations to local politicians. One of the local politicians Jeff wrote about was Democrat Robert Tellis. Tellis was the Clark County Public Administrator. Jeff published a series of investigative pieces uncovering turmoil in the administrator's office and claims of bullying, retaliation, and an inappropriate relationship between Tellis and a staffer. After the articles were published, Tellis lost his re-election bid. Then, three months later, Jeff Gurman was stabbed to death. The murder sent shockwaves through his newsroom, and investigators quickly followed a trail that led to Tellis, who was arrested and charged with murder. Tonight, the latest in the investigation, the motive, and the bizarre arrest video. I'm Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. I don't know where you were in the early 70s, but I know where I was. I was parked in front of a television and really had my first brush with journalism as a very young child watching what was happening with the President of the United States at the time, Richard Milhouse Nixon and the whole Watergate scandal. And even though I was relatively young, what I was seeing and, and being exposed to for the very first time was a huge lesson. And, and that was the power that journalists have and the role that journalists have in our nation, which is to hold powerful people like the President of the United States accountable. And, and the entire, and, and, and you got to witness a president literally being taken down by journalism because he was not honest. He was doing something wrong, breaking the law. And as a result, out of office. Game changing moment for me, for me. And again, the lesson I learned is that the job of a journalist is to question the government, right? Journalists and the government should never be on the same page. Never. Always question the, I mean, we need someone to do that. And, and journalism in this country, the United States, is not run by the government. We are independent. We're like the fourth estate, the fourth branch of government. To hold them accountable, to try to keep them honest, which is a tough job, keeping the government honest. And any time that a journalist is not questioning the government, or is burying stories that perhaps could harm someone who, for whatever reason, a member of the media or a media outlet might support, you're no longer doing journalism. You're just not doing it. Should never be on the same side. Can't be. I mean, that's, that was what the founding fathers envisioned. Doesn't happen all the time, but let me tell you about uh, Jeff Gehrman out in Las Vegas, this is a guy, he did his job, an investigative journalist. And let me tell you, uh, you go around the country and there's lots of them that are very, very good. And they're the ones that, like Jeff, who, who look at what's happening wherever they are. He happened to be in, in Clark County in Las Vegas, out in, in Nevada. And you look at, okay, well, is everyone being honest here? People who are powerful whether it's a corporation, it could be law enforcement, and a lot of times politicians who aren't doing the right thing. Well, he was doing his job and it resulted in some really bad press for a local politician named Rob Tellis. And this is someone who's a county administrator. He's also a lawyer, father, husband, all of that. But apparently there were some things that were uncovered that were going on in his office. They made Tellus look really bad. He ended up losing his reelection. And all this stuff became very public. So the question we're looking at tonight is, because Jeff Garriman is not alive, somebody murdered him. Is it possible 
that bad press is a motive for murder in the United States of America? I want you to take a listen to this story from KNTV, our great affiliate in Las Vegas. Alyssa Bethencourt has some of the background of what happened in Vegas. The investigation into journalist Jeff German's death began Saturday at his home. His lifeless body found outside stabbed multiple times. In the days that followed, Metro Police searched for the person responsible, asking the public to come forward with information. They released images showing a man wearing a straw hat, a reflective vest, dark pants, and gloves. They also posted this picture of the car they believed the suspect was driving at the time of the murder. That looks like a vehicle just like in uh, Telus' driveway. Um, so that was really concerning and surprising. On Wednesday, Metro's investigation ended at the home of Clark County Public Administrator Robert Tellez, the elected official now suspected of killing him. Tellez had publicly criticized German on social media and on his campaign website for a series of articles the investigative reporter published. Metro wrapped up their initial investigation yesterday afternoon, and Tellez returned home dressed in a full body jumper. Do you need to tell us anything? Hours later, police returned, knocking on his door without answer. SWAT teams were called in, beginning an hours-long standoff, which ended here. Tellez loaded into an ambulance and taken to UMC Trauma to be treated for what police sources called non-life-threatening injuries. Unbelievable story. And again, are, are we talking about a politician who perhaps is up to no good in, in his office and has some problems, loses an election, and then turns around and blames everything on the journalist? for doing their job? Let's find out more. Joining me now in Las Vegas, Nevada, radio talk show host, commentator for News Talk 840, KXNT, a man who knows more about Vegas than Mo Green, Alan Stock is with us. Alan, great to see you tonight. Thank you very much. Appreciate having me. Let's, let's start with what was going on in Vegas between these two men. Um, how, how big of a story was it when uh, Jeff Garman was writing these articles about the county administrator and what was going on in his office. It was a big story because uh, Atellis was running for re-election and of course uh, he was uh, defeated and a lot of it was because, because of the articles that uh, Jeff uh, Garman was writing about and uh, chronicling the, um, uh, the, the hostile work environment that was going on and uh, some of the uh, uh, threats that were made in his office. So people were very concerned about it. As it turns out now, uh, after everything's been said and done, that the people who worked with him said they actually uh, had a lot of fear for themselves. And after um, uh, Jeff Garman was killed, they actually feared for their uh, own safety, their lives. Are, are you t people from his office who may have provided some of the information to uh, uh, Jeff? Absolutely. Oh, no. They, he was in touch with the people on a regular basis, and he kept coming back to, um, uh, to them to get more information. And as they came out and said that they were very concerned about, about his behavior, they would uh, reach out to Jeff, and he was the one who was writing it. And as you mentioned, he wrote an article, and uh, he wrote several articles, and he was um, denied re-election. That's not it, though, only because after the uh, uh, after all this was said and done, he was coming out with another article as a follow up to what was going on in that office, even though he was uh, tell us was a um, uh, only there for another few months. He still uh, was in office, and Garman had information that he was going to uh, to write, and Atellus was uh, was really ticked off about it enough so so um, he apparently uh, took uh, Jeff's life. Unfortunate. And, and as I, you know, I'm trying to get a, a grasp on who these two guys are. Let's start with, with uh, Jeff Garriman. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't know about him mm -hmm. until this story happened. But then I started looking around and saying, wow, this guy, he's like the old school investigative journalist going out there, rolling up the sleeves, finding sources and, and trying to hold politicians and powerful people accountable for their actions. Yeah, he, he's been uh, around for 40 years and has been writing about various uh, issues uh, and uh, wrote about a fire that uh, happened in 2019 uh, that uh, existed in, in a hotel as a result of uh, 
a, a failure of the uh, local authorities to be able to uh, look at the hotel and gauge the uh, the safety of the hotel. He also was a uh, an author of a book called uh, Murder in Sin City. It was the death of Las Vegas casino boss, and it was about Ted Binion. And uh, let me tell you, Alan, Ted Binion, we covered that trial on Court TV. That was I a remember. epic, epic case. Uh, sorry, I interrupt you. Continue, please. No, I mean that you know he he did all the and recently he was writing and hosting season two of something called Mobbed Up, the flight for Vegas. That was the uh, review journal the paper he worked for, the Las Vegas Review Journal's um, a true crime podcast. So that's what was going on um, as uh, his latest adventure. In addition to the fact that he was writing, coming up with additional stories about um, about Telus. And I, you know, as you were talking at the beginning of this whole thing, I, I, I don't think it's bad press. I don't think this has, has anything to do with press. I know, you know, press people get bad raps here and there, but I think what it had to do with was a very personal thing. I mean, this guy uh, was having things written about him, uh, and, and I'm sure true, and he lost a political office because of it, an elective office, and um, and now... Uh, there were more things that were going to be coming out about affairs he had in the office and uh, preferential treatment that he was giving to people. Uh, and some of this was uh, was hurting him uh, personally. And he said that to one person at one point that, you know, what I, I think people have done is actually ruined my life. And he referred to uh, Garriman, but he referred to a couple of the people in the office as well. Yeah, it, it seemed that things were unraveling because, I mean, I look at Talis and, you know, he's got the a beautiful wife, beautiful children. Um, he's yeah. a lawyer, you know. All right, you lost an election. So you move on. You're a lawyer. You go out and you, you go back to work. And you make some money. Uh, but you mentioned it seemed to go personal. Was there a lot of any reported interaction between the two prior to the murder? There was some interaction between the two of them, but um, uh, I, I think that as Garman kept hearing from people in the office and he kept writing things, I think people, uh, I think Tellus, again, was taking this very personally. I understand that. I mean, it was personal to Tellus because it was written about him, and it certainly could harm uh, his future uh, in standing in the community. But the thing is, is if he treated the people in his office like he did, like Gehrman wrote about, like the people in the office told Gehrman about what was going on, he created his own hell. I mean, he really did. When you look at it, no one did this to him. Gehrman reported what was going on and nothing more than that. This guy created his own situation and brought himself down. And then he took a, uh, a guy who was uh, well-loved in the media community here, in the general media community, and he, uh, he brutally murdered him. And so I have, I have no sympathy for him at all. I know he deserves his day in court, and he should get his day in court. Yeah, and, well, well, uh, yeah we understand that. You know, we're Court yeah, TV. Our yeah, viewers yeah. understand that. you got to prove the case. Yeah. Presumption of innocence, all of that. Sure. Uh, but trying to understand uh, who, who everyone is. What do we know about the day of the murder? Like, what was going on? Have there been um, more information? And, and can you kind of give us the local flavor about where these guys lived, et cetera? Well, when it came out initially, uh, it was just a uh, it was it was a murder that occurred, and uh, it, it wasn't long after that it came out that it was uh, Jeff Gehrman who was killed. And uh, that made everybody kind of uh, sit up and say, what, what's happening? As the uh, sheriff said today, as he was having uh, a press conference, um, you go after journalists like this, it becomes a threat to be able to have a free exchange of ideas. And um, I'm not speaking as a journalist. I'm a, a, a talk show host and a commentator. So I don't, I don't bill myself as a journalist. But journalists are out there supposedly trying to be able to get the facts and put information out. I think this is what Jeff was doing. He did that throughout a lot of his life. Ticked off some people, you know, throughout the years. A good but journalist does, was, right, Alan? I mean, a good journalist is going to yeah. make some enemies along the way because you're, you're doing your job. He made an enemy of a guy now who apparently... I will see. Apparently, is somewhat mentally unstable. Yeah. I mean, uh, somebody attacks you uh, verbally. Do you take a knife and and, and slash them? Yeah, well, the answer is is no. But this guy obviously had some 
mental issues. I think that'll probably come out. Shouldn't mitigate what he did. Shouldn't mitigate what, how they should, uh, the, the, uh, you know, f find him guilty or whatever and whatever they should do to him afterwards. But, uh, you know, uh, what normal person, ask yourself, is going to go out and respond to verbal attacks by, by murdering somebody like this? I mean, it makes no sense, especially when I look at those pictures on his um, on his re-election website and the pictures with his family and everything else. I mean, you're a man, you're responsible for the for your family. You do whatever you have to do. All right. This is a setback. You, 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 you know, get back up on and and move ahead. I want to take a listen to what the judge said at the arraignment today. Um, a little okay. bit of uh, some of the details from the report that was provided to the court. Let's take a listen. As it relates to the first degree murder, um, it appears from, from this report, Mr. Tellis was waiting and called the, the uh, victim over to the side of his own home. And according to the surveillance, ended up mounting the victim. And of course, he's, he suffered injuries and then death. And so that's the finding I make for my order of detention. Detention meaning he's he's locked up tonight and you know potentially mm -hmm. for the rest of his life. Alan Stock uh, from KXNT 840 News Talk out in Vegas. Appreciate your time and your insight tonight. Thank Thanks you. so much, Alan. Have a good night. All right. When we come back, uh, we've got more to get to on this case. We're going to go through um, some of the evidence, more into this motive and exactly what. Uh, Jeff Garman was uncovering that might make someone snap. Plus, coming up next hour. In Memphis, Tennessee, billionaire heiress Eliza Fletcher abducted and murdered while going for a run near the University of Memphis. Investigators quickly arrested this man, a career criminal. Tonight, Court TV has obtained surveillance video, which could be a crucial piece of evidence. Is this the accused killer attempting to clean up the crime scene and evade justice? We take a closer look. In the time frame that he went there to clean that truck up and to wash them clothes, he had to be done, just dumped her body. We licensed everything. I'd like to ask you for your help now. I'd like to ask you to please be sure to vote for me in this year's election. Please be sure to tell your friends and family about it. This is an important race and I need your help. I'm Rob Tellis and I'm running for Clark County Public Administrator. Thank you. I am Rob. Robert Tellis was elected Clark County Public Administrator in Nevada back in 2018. His four year term was coming to an end after he lost his bid for re-election this past June. Just weeks before the election, Las Vegas Review-Journal reporter Jeff Garman wrote an investigative report into Telus's allegedly hostile workplace environment. The report was published on May 16th and reads in part, the Clark County Public Administrator's Office has been mired in turmoil and internal dissension over the past two years with allegations of emotional stress bullying and favoritism leading to a secret videotaping of the boss and co-worker outside the office. A half a dozen current and former employees interviewed by the Review Journal are alleging the hostile work environment was fueled by the elected administrator of the office, Robert Tellis, carrying on an inappropriate relationship with a staffer. It goes on to say, Several employees took the bold step of secretly videotaping Tellus and Lee Kennett meeting in the back seat of her car at a parking garage to show proof of the relationship. The secret video recording, which was published online by the Las Vegas Journal Review, along with the article, appears to show a man and a woman in the back seat of a red SUV before they exit the car and enter the front driver and passenger seats. The reporter, Jeff Gehrman, identified the man as Robert Tellis. Now you may know why he was angry. 
Let's bring in our experts. Joining me in New York City, retired deputy inspector of the New York Police Department and author of Once a Cop, Corey Pegues is with us. In Salt Lake City, Utah, private investigator Jason Jensen. And also in New York City, psychotherapist and host of Talking Live on Facebook Watch and the Bite Side podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. Great to see everyone. We're going to focus this time right now on alleged motive, right? Why? Why would this man allegedly go after an investigative reporter? Let me start with you, Dr. Robbie Ludwig. Is it about the election or is it about exposing what was being exposed inside that car? Well, what I imagine is that Telus thought that this reporter was ruining his life and was exposing him and perhaps was even responsible for him losing his political position instead of owning the fact that maybe he did things that ruined his own chances. And so it's almost like an eye for an eye. You ruined my life. You're going to continue to out me and say bad things about me. I'm going to stop you. And for the person who's mentally unstable or unhealthy, they sometimes stop it via death. You know, killing. Jason Jensen, I'm looking at that video and I'm thinking like these coworkers or subordinates, whoever they were in his office who allegedly recorded this video, great private detectives. Getting, and this is like those videos that you would see on, uh, what's that show? Um, Cheaters, Cheers. right? Looks like a scene from Cheaters. Um, your, your thoughts about, you know, how people respond when they've been outed, when they've been allegedly caught cheating on their wife, or they've been caught or exposed, you know, acting inappropriately at work? Well, this is an ex. A, a very good example of where Title VII uh, at the workplace and infidelity cross over. So I've seen these kinds of videos dozens and dozens of times. Uh, clearly from what I could see from watching the video, it's consistent with what I do, where you can see two heads and it looks like they kiss and they even lean over. So you can tell there's that inappropriate relationship and the problem that has when you're a supervisor at work is that it uh, creates hostility at the workplace because you now sense that when you're not that person in that relationship, you're being overlooked and in the shadow of this rising star is getting all the boss's uh, favorite attention because there's a relationship there that shouldn't exist. So when, when this all goes down, it's very ugly and I rarely see it turn to, well, I've never seen it turn to murder, but I rarely see it turn to violence. But there's always that risk that if someone gets outed, they're gonna come after you. So, you know, I always caution people like the coworkers took matters in their own hand and did their own video. But if they were caught, you know, gosh. They and they were fearful the too. Mrs. Garman. Yeah, yeah, some of the, some the, of the Garman. people providing the information were fearful as well. Corey Pegues, let me all ask right. you, in all your years, uh, in law enforcement, have you ever seen a case with with an alleged motive like this, where it's about a public figure being, you know, his life turned upside down because he was allegedly not acting appropriately, and in a very public way, a member of the media ends up being the victim? No, uh, again, thanks for having me. Well, you know, I live in New York City, the mecca of politics, one of the meccas of politics. This is not unusual. Actually, this has happened quite often in New York City politics, but it has never resulted in someone murdering uh, one of the politicians that outed them. They usually did exactly what you say, pick up the pieces, get back on with their life. And some of them even was brave enough to run again for re-election. Oh, yeah, they'll run it. And, and even if they were wearing the socks during the whole thing, they, they'll pick up the pieces and maybe get a TV we, show. We saw that happen you know, in we New got York. The biggest, we got the biggest case in New York with Hillary Clinton's assistant that worked for, for uh, you know, worked for her husband, you know. Oh, yeah. Not Spitzer. I forget his name, but not Elliot Spitzer, the other guy who had their fear yeah. on a national stage. Unbelievable. All right, Dr. Robbie Ludwig, here's the other part that 
I want to see if you can help us understand. Uh, again, these are allegations. He's presumed innocent. He's only been arrested. Everyone watching Court TV knows that and understands it. Um, but these are allegations, right, by the prosecution. How is it possible, or is it possible, that someone who has a family, beautiful children, beautiful wife, you know, can throw, potentially throw that all away, not through the conduct, but by the much worse alleged conduct, which is murder, which means you will, you will never see your kids again, you'll never be free again. How, how inside someone's mind does it work? The guy's a lawyer. The guy's a lawyer. You know you kill someone, you get caught, that's it, it's over. Like, versus like, okay, I got caught maybe with my pants down. Right. And so it is hard to make sense out of. We have somebody who is an attorney who appears successful, who obviously was chosen to be a, a political figure. But when somebody is in that enraged state and they are a murderer, they're not thinking consciously. They're not thinking, okay, if I kill this man who I hate, then I might lose everything. They're acting more on a primal rate. And if we think about the characteristics of somebody who is in politics, they like the idea of power and dominating people and having control. So it might have been just a combination of who this man was, um, a grandiosity he experienced being in politics, and maybe feeling like he could get away with things because he was such an important person. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, great to see you tonight. Um, Corey Pegues, Jason Jensen staying with us. When we come back, uh, we're going to take you to the scene and take a look at some of the evidence in this case. Uh, can prosecutors prove this? How did investigators allegedly solve this? All that when we return. What is this outfit? What is this? Is the alleged killer? of Jeff Gehrman, the journalist, investigative reporter out in Vegas. This is the killer. That's what they're telling us. What's going on with that outfit? Unbelievable. All right, um, Captain Dory uh, Corn from the Las Vegas Metro Police uh, spoke a little bit more about what we saw in that picture and some of the evidence that they have in the case. Let's take a listen. The suspect as you see here in the photo to my left, your right, was wearing an orange shirt with reflective stripes, a straw hat, and was carrying a duffel bag. And what was likely an attempt to either disguise his identity or conceal his identity. We also know that the suspect was walking westbound, approaching Garman's home on Friday, September 2nd, the day prior to us being notified. On that morning, he approached Mr. Garriman's home and went to the side of the house. Shortly after, Garriman came outside of the garage door and then went to the side of the house, and ultimately an altercation took place between the suspect and the victim. We believe this happened around 11, 18 a.m., and at that time, our victim was stabbed multiple times. On day two of our major case protocol, we, de we developed a very critical lead, which was a vehicle that we identified it was a maroon-colored GMC Denali that was suspiciously driving around in the neighborhood on the morning of the murder, prior to the murder, and then certainly was there uh, at the time when the murder happened. That vehicle had stopped multiple times uh, throughout the neighborhood and was behaving suspiciously or was suspicious. The second key piece on day two was we determined that the suspect wearing the orange shirt had fled in that vehicle, which connected the vehicle to the suspect. There was a vehicle that matched a suspect's vehicle description, that maroon GMC Denali that was parked in front of Telus's home. It was registered to his wife. And then we ultimately developed video evidence that showed that that vehicle, the GMC Denali parked in front of Telus's home, had departed around 9 a.m. in the morning on the day of the murder and it returned around 12 p.m. just after the murder, which matched our timeline. We immediately began working on search warrants 
And then we began searching, we executed the search warrants early yesterday morning, and that involved searching Telus's home, his vehicles, and then also searching his body to collect the DNA sample to compare it to DNA recovered during the crime. We developed information that indicated Telus was driving the GMC Denali the morning of the murder. We also, through the search warrant effort, we recovered a pair of shoes, as you'll see here on my screen here to the left, that matched the suspect's description. Um, also, as you can see, there's apparent blood on the shoes, and the shoes were cut, likely in a manner to try to destroy evidence. In addition to the shoes, we recovered a straw hat that was also cut in, uh, in a manner that was likely to destroy the evidence. And that straw hat, as you can see, matches the one in the photo. Uh, just something to point out, that black brim is actually the interior part of the hat, a sweatband, not the exterior part. But we analyzed the hat, analyzed the shoes, and then ultimately, uh, one of the most important aspects of this investigation was waiting on the DNA results. And we received positive DNA results that showed Robert Tellis' DNA at the crime scene. Las Vegas Metro. Unbelievable job in this investigation. Still with us, retired Deputy Inspector Corey Pegues, private investigator Jason Jensen, joining us now in Columbia, South Carolina, retired medical examiner and forensic pathologist Dr. Michelle Dupree. Uh, Dr. Dupree, what um, this is a, a stabbing, I believe it was seven times. What will this autopsy reveal? And um, is there any DNA collection that's done during the autopsy process? Yes, there is. There is always DNA uh, samples taken from blood. There is also fingernail scrapings, um, which in this case should yield some DNA um, under the fingernails. And the autopsy itself will reveal the basically the length of the knife, perhaps, that was used, um, and also any organs, of course, that were damaged um, and the cause of death. Now, Jason Jensen, looking at that photo and then the video, that outfit, from your perspective, what is the significance of all that? Like, I've never seen anything quite like that. If you're, if you're going to murder someone and try to quietly get away, why would you have a ridiculous hat and a reflective jacket on? I, I'm trying to figure this out. Really, it's, it's an odd combination, to say the least. It, it looks like, to me, just like the captain just alluded, is that he was attempting to conceal his identity, number one, because... You know, gosh, there's surveillance cameras everywhere in urban settings, especially residential nowadays. And I would also venture to guess that he was hoping that if he had enough of his body covered, including gloves in the heat of the summer, that maybe his DNA would be minimalized in transfer and maybe even get away with no DNA uh, being, you know, there at the crime scene. But it, clearly it did turn out that way. Corey Pegues, looks like uh, Las Vegas Metro has dotted their I's and crossed their T's in, in putting, pe literally putting pieces together. This is a torn up uh, hat, and, and it seems like they're putting all the pieces together in this investigation. Yeah, Vinny, this is a classic case of you have to know your lane in life. This guy should have stayed away from crime. I wish in policing we had this crime all the evidence. This was police in 101. You could have took a, 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 a academy cop from a six hour training to solve this case. I mean, we're in Las Vegas. It got to be what, 100 degrees? I mean, I'm on the East Coast, but it got to be very hot. You got a big straw hat on. You got this reflective dress. And not only that, he brings all the evidence home. This, I, I think this guy wanted to be caught. Your previous guest, uh, the radio analyst, said he thinks this guy got um, a mental condition. I'm not buying that. I never buy that, especially with this guy. He went to he went through law school, had a great job, all of these things, and now he want to take that defense. I'm not buying it. He and he wanted to get revenge. But uh, like you said, he should have picked up the pieces of his life, got back on track. Anthony Weiner did it. Elliot Spitzer did it. And there's you know Marion Barry did it. Even after smoking crack. They all have done it. Politicians have bounced back. Uh, Dr. Dupree, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about this case and, and, and a stabbing death. It, it just strikes me that it seems that it's much more personal, which seems to be in line with the allegations of what we were talking about in the motive here, that it was a very personal type of killing. You're absolutely right. 
anytime you have such close contact between the victim and the perpetrator, it is very personal. It's much like strangulation. It's not like staying across the room and shooting a gun. This was a very personal attack of rage. Jason Jensen, are there any, you know, we've seen some of the evidence outlined already by uh, Metro Police. Are there any outstanding questions that you have or, or things that you think need to be uh, uncovered in this investigation that haven't already been uncovered? Well, it really looks like they did a bang up job. They got DNA to, uh, tying them to the crime scene. There's video surveillance that matches the articles of, you know, that he was wearing that they found at his residence. Surveillance puts his wife's uh, Denali at the crime scene and the suspect fled in it. There's really not much there. It's pretty much an airtight case that I see. I don't see anything outstanding. Now, obviously they're still gonna do more investigating. They're probably going to you know, collect all of his digital uh, devices, see where his cell phone was, see if there was correspondence communications to anybody. There's, you know, another party involved in that. I want, we wonder at how much he shared with that person and if there was a chance that that other person could have come forward to stop this. Jason Jensen, great to see you tonight. Appreciate your time. Dr. Michelle Dupree, great to see you as well. Corey Pegues, I need you to stay in lockdown because when we come back, we're going to take a look at this bizarre arrest scenario. Um, it wasn't a traditional arrest. Plus, coming up next hour. And on the docket tonight in Tallahassee, Florida, the murder of FSU law professor Dan Markell. Prosecutors say he was killed in the middle of a bitter custody battle. The victim of a murder for hire by his former brother-in-law, South Florida dentist Charlie Adelson. We have the latest. senseless tragedy in small town America. This was a pre-planned execution. It was a feud between families that ended with multiple murders. You came in like thieves in the night and took eight lives. George Wagner faces murder charges in connection with the killer. Wagner's brother and parents also charged. It's very much a family affair. All for one, one for all. It's a chilling story. It will be an intense trial. The Ohio Family Massacre Trial. Live coverage starting Monday morning on Court 85 Now. We've got some uh, strange video of the arrest here. Th that's the, the defendant in the hazmat suit being chased by reporters going into his house. Uh, he had been down at, at headquarters giving some DNA and they're executing a search warrant on his clothes. Then the whole neighborhood seems to be locked down. And then finally, he's taken out on a stretcher. This was a, a, a strange, strange scenario. That's the defendant. From hazmat suit to stretcher, not your everyday arrest of a murder suspect. Here's uh, Captain Dory Corn from Las Vegas Metro explaining some of what happened. Suspect, uh, but I can tell you the footage you saw him coming out on the stretcher. He has he had self-inflicted uh, wounds, and we were trying to provide medical attention to help him. You yes, ma'am. Describe the wounds. Uh, so uh, at, at this time, I cannot describe the wounds, but they, we do know that they were not life threatening. So he was brought back to the home. We saw him go back in the hazmat suit, presumably because his clothes were taken. And then we sort of saw SWAT come in. He was uncooperative coming out. Is there going to be any look at the fact that an entire neighborhood was evacuated for a suspect with a... You were, you were on to him. It, uh, you were, I understand you were waiting for that DNA, but... That two-hour window could have turned, uh, could have been very different. So is there going to be any look at not releasing a potential murder suspect back to his home like that? You know, the, there's a reason why uh, people from all across the United States come to Las Vegas to apply with our agents to become police officers and detectives and SWAT officers and all that. And it's because we have a very professional and effective way of how we safely take people into custody in these types of very dynamic situations. And that was proven yesterday. And then the second reason is we have a community that's very supportive. So I understand some people might be frustrated with the disruption, but uh, the way the operation worked, uh, the community was supportive of how we did it. And they were certainly supportive of the outcome because everyone is safe today. All right, let's bring back in Corey Pegues, retired NYPD deputy inspector, also author of Once a Cop. 
Corey, your thoughts about the way he was taken into custody here. I guess first they execute the search warrant, take his clothes, put him in a hazmat suit, but he goes home, and they evacuate the whole neighborhood, then the SWAT unit comes in. Your thoughts? Well, I don't necessarily have an issue with the way they did, um, did it. They was waiting for that DNA evidence to come back. Uh, they should have had somebody sitting outside of that home. I do believe they should have definitely had somebody sitting out there outside of his home. But the way they executed the arrest, the main thing for the citizens out there, they was inconvenienced for two for two hours. But Mr. German's family is inconvenienced for the rest of their lives. They're not going to see their loved ones. So I, I would give them that two hours. They, you know, hey, they, expect, they took a murderer off the street, Vinny. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, dotting the I's, crossing the T's, and, and following the law and the constitutional rights of the defendant has to be a little frustrating, though, for investigators when they know this is the guy they're going to arrest, but they have to wait for these results. And while they're waiting for the results, they have to release the defendant and let him go home behind closed doors, which I guess potentially could be dangerous either to the defendant or to officers who now had him at the precinct, but now have to go back in to get him. Not only that, what if he goes back? You know, I don't know all the intricacies of what happened, but how about him going to his place of work and committing mass murder? We don't know. You know, I'm looking at the SWAT go there and said, did they have any information that he had legal firearms inside of the home? We don't know. You know, this will all probably come out in court later. But um, having a SWAT go there and not having a tail on him, at least having a, a cop sitting outside of that home, because you want to have eyes on this guy. There was too much circumstantial evidence to not have eyes on him. So it's just hard for me to believe that they just said, OK, you can go home and see yeah. the family. I, I, my my guess is that they, yeah, that they did have people, you know, keeping an eye on the house. And, and the media was keeping an eye on the house as well. You saw the reporter literally like chasing him to his garage and then he, he went inside. <laughs> yes. Um, but I'm always concerned about the, the potential danger. And I guess in, in this particular case, um, he was a danger to himself to a certain extent. Let's talk about that for a second. When you've got a murder suspect, but someone who may have mental issues, someone who may be threatening to take his own life, uh, that's a delicate balance as well. Yeah, this reminds me of... Um Michael Timmons back in the, the 90s, uh, it was a case that I was involved in, the precinct 114 precinct in Astoria, Queens. He chopped his wife's head off and three of his kids' heads off in the house over at Ravenswood's Projects in, in Astoria. And when we bust through the door, he was sitting on a chair and he put some superficial wounds, you know, on his wrist as if he wanted to kill himself. He was sitting in the house with three decapitated heads. But, but sometimes, these but sometimes they want to make it look like they're killing themselves. They want to kill themselves, but they don't actually do it, although they're being accused of knowing how to end a life. And in this case, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the murder charge. Um, so, Corey, as this case goes, and there we see him on the stretcher. I mean, that's the other thing people forget, right? He tries <laughs> yes. to do something. Now you not only have to like, take him into custody, but you've got to make sure that he survives. Exactly. What, so this is the part where police officers got to display a tremendous amount of restraint. I told you about this guy. Imagine going to a crime scene and four heads are cut off, kids nine years old, six years old, a woman. And you have to use a tremendous amount of restraint. That's why I give cops, good cops, all of the credit for the work that they do every single day. We're not talking about that very small percentage of bad cops, but the overwhelming majority of the cops are gone and they are, they are really doing a good job out there. Good cops like Corey Pegues. Corey Pegues, great to see you. Um, uh, we'll see you, you again too, real baby. soon. Thanks so much.